Welcome to Spiritual Directions with Father Joseph Matlack and Father Joshua Voidis. Join them each week as they unpack the timeless wisdom of our forebears in the faith and show you how it points you toward a greater Christian life. Hello and welcome to the Spiritual Directions podcast. You might notice that for the first time ever, instead of Father Matlack, I'm leading off. Um, I think we're doing that a little bit because we're, I don't want to say we're changing formats, but we're kind of maybe moving to a new phase in the way we're going to be doing the podcast. The This podcast, as you know, is meant to be a largely patristics-based podcast, and, and that's what we've been doing. But what we've been doing so far is having a look at some concepts that the the church fathers, they were very important in the church fathers, and concepts maybe, especially in terms of the language that maybe needed to, to be explained a little bit, um, that had maybe not maybe been lost entirely in the church today, but concepts, names, sort of things that maybe we weren't so familiar with. And also in the context of Lent, going through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Now we'd like to shift a little bit, and we kind of have been doing that for the first co- for the last couple of episodes, to kind of shift a little bit to looking at some of the fathers individually. Last two episodes, we looked in particular at Seraphim Musarov, who is maybe not contemporary, but much more contemporary than we generally consider um, church fathers, especially in the West, where we consider them as kind of the early kind of pillars of the church. So we want to start today, um, we're kind of debating when, how to start, with whom to start, and we finally rested on maybe starting at the beginning with um, Clement of of Rome, Clement of Rome being one of the earliest, if not the earliest, apostolic fathers. The apostolic fathers, when we use that term, we re- we mean specifically those men who were taught directly by the apostles, and in many cases were the immediate successors to the apostles. And so we talk about the bishops today as successors to the apostles through the laying on of hands, but these men were successors to the apostles in that Clement of Rome, it's believed, was made a bishop by St. Peter himself and succeeded St. Peter in Rome in the very early days of the church. And when we we're going to look through, um, and Father Matlack can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we only have, is it one letter of St. Clement that we have kind of extant, or maybe there's a little bit more than that? I think there are others, but the authorship of those, I'm not sure. Okay, so maybe only one that we're sure that he wrote. And I then, think so. And then maybe there's some more that we're... Um, we, we think he might have written. And, and you find when we talk about the church fathers and even in, in the desert fathers and things, there you find that a lot. You find a lot of, well, we know he wrote these and we think maybe he might have written these or parts of these other ones or whatever. So um, not a lot of, I guess, writings, though, you know, not whole books or anything. But we're, we're going to look through his letter to the, who did he write the, his epistle to? Let's see. So he is uh, addressing it from the Church of God at Rome to the Church of God at Corinth. Okay. And so we're going to be able to see, I think, as we go through it, some of the particular concerns of the early church, of the very early church. You know, what was, you know, because... um, you can see it, obviously, we can see it in scripture, and it's kind of, it's interesting that this is kind of post-scriptural, you know, it's not part of the Bible, but it still kind of retains a little bit of that flavor of maybe some of Paul's epistles as well, you know, addressing certain concerns. But the idea, which I think is very interesting, especially when we look back on these very early Christian writings is that at the time, writing a letter wasn't quite as easy as it is now, right? So we write text messages, we can send emails. Um, You know, before the advent of the internet, writing letters was fairly common, you know, because pen and paper and and that sort of thing is very easy to come by. Back then, it wasn't so easy to come by, and even literacy wasn't quite so easy to come by. So when we look at these early letters especially, they have kind of this weight of importance to them, that this is what these people thought what believed to be very important at the time. You know, we send, like I said, a lot of, a lot of messages, especially over the internet and on our phones now, that, you know, they kind of come and they go, and, and, and we don't really remember them. 
because maybe they're not that important. They're a little bit flippant. There's a lot of memes that we send, you know, back and forth. And, but these are th these letters will be addressing things that these people not addressing everything, not addressing kind of all of the details of the faith, but things that they found specifically important and maybe that were under attack or maybe you know a little bit dangerous at the time. So we're going to read some of these things. We're going to kind of see not only what what was going on back then, but really how those concerns the concerns of Clement and some of the other ones that we're going to read in future episodes, how they kind of impact us now and why, not just why they were concerning, you know, some 2000 years ago, but why they, why these things should also be concerning to us today. And so um, we'll just kind of, like I say, read, read a couple of sections and maybe um, comment on it a little bit or elaborate a little bit on it. Yeah. I was going to say that it's very um, relevant to the contemporary sphere as, as we go along and read these things. You know, for example, um, he begins by pointing out the uh, disagreements and even the splits that are taking place in the church in Corinth. We see some of this in the scriptures, you know, because St. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's looking at different factions and he wants them to stay together. And isn't that the history of Christianity? It's, it's scandalous, right? Non-Christians look in and say, well, you're all divided. Yes. And there are tens of thousands of denominations or whatever, and you're all divided. And even sometimes inside of denominations. Right. There's, there's not maybe a whole lot of unity inside some of those. And because we, we've seen that fairly recently with some denominations, especially in America, where there's been big debates inside and even splits inside those denominations very recently. Uh, you know, especially like regarding contemporary moral issues and things like that. Right. And so, you know, there's a line that Clement says here, and I think someone who's reading Clement could have written the same line in, in review of Clement. He says, we're struggling in the same arena and the same conflict is assigned to both of us. So, I mean, this is what's happening. It's happened back then and it's happening now. And the thing is, Christians, I don't know, sometimes it might seem that we're used to it. We're used to these divisions in the church. On the one hand, we should be horrified by them. On the other hand, it doesn't surprise us because the truth has a way of causing division that's internal to kind of manifest. Well, right? we, I, I think we view them as kind of inevitable, right? As, yeah. as though, like the idea that you know, all Christians would one day be reunited together is almost like when we first hear it, almost laughable, you know, yeah. just like almost an absurdity, because how could that possibly be, you know, but to it was it was not like that in the beginning. All the division was not like that in the beginning. And Clement and like you said, like you mentioned, even St. Paul writing to some of these early churches is deeply concerned with what might happen, you know, with like you say, the scandal that it presents, you know, if, 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 if you're all, how can, how can you all be following the Bible and disagreeing about so much? How can, you know, how can, you know, if Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to keep the church in truth and unity, how can there be so much division? And so it causes scandal in the true sense of the word in that it keeps people away from Christ. And this was something especially Clement um, was was deeply and profoundly concerned with. But it's also something that we'll see um, later on. We're going to look at Ignatius of Antioch, and we'll see echoes of that, certainly in the, in the writings of St. Ignatius as well. Absolutely. And how does Clement start? How does he propose that people should uh, resolve this issue? Well, he does the same as the gospel, in fact. He calls them to repentance. He says, let's just focus... Uh, that's, sorry, that's my little <laughs> translation. <ever. laughs> that's let's just go ahead and... and what is, it, what is it you say in the South? Fixing to get ready to do something? <laughs> fix Let's it. fix to get ready to, and he says this, to attend to what is good, pleasing, and acceptable in the sight of him who formed us. Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ and see how precious that blood is to God, which having been shed for our salvation has set the grace of repentance before the whole world. Um. And so that's what he says. Okay, just be humble, go back to the truth, and focus on what has been given to you. And the thing is, if we want to look at any division in its beginning, maybe not now, right? But in its beginning, all of these divisions in Christendom, and really all division, divisions between human beings, right? They all have their origin in pride. 
Yeah. They all have their origin in this, you know, I know better, I am special, I have been given some kind of secret knowledge, you know, to be able to comprehend this in another way. You know, I am I know better than God in one way. And the thing is, you can look at that throughout the history of the church, and we can see that both what some people inside the church, the Catholic church, are doing that is prideful, that causes other prideful men to rear up against it and then cause a division. And we see it over and over again. I mentioned earlier some of the divisions in 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 the in the Catholic Church, maybe not formal divisions in, within the Catholic Church, because they're within the Catholic Church, but in also coming formal divisions seemingly in various Protestant communities in the United States, it has, you know, very often a lot of those things are based on well, I know what has always been taught as moral, maybe say as regards sexuality, but I know better. And it's a very prideful kind of thing where mm -hmm. I have been given some kind of knowledge. I know better. And therefore I and the people who agree with me are going to go off and divide against this other group of people. And we see that division kind of repeat almost like kind of like a fractal pattern almost, you know, th throughout history. And so for division for division to be healed for unity to be achieved that's absolutely right it has to be based first of first i think kind of the, the very first thing is that humility right. that that willingness to to submit to the will of god that's right and you mentioned your pride right the 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 word diabolic comes from the greek meaning to separate or to split apart so the devil's um influence is precisely to divide and 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 what clement is saying that in order to unite or to reunite firstly he says repentance right um, and then he talks a lot about humility he says let's be of humble mind let's lay aside all haughtiness and pride and foolishness and angry feelings and let's act according to what's written um, and he talks about humility. He gives various quotes from the New Testament, from, from the Word of God, about humility. And then he talks about how we are to do that. And he says, obey God rather than the authors of um, sedition and division, um, who are sometimes present things in a very attractive way. Oh, yes. In order to divide people. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is, the, the problem is sometimes, because Christianity, the truth of Christianity, authentic Christianity, and I, and I say this in homilies a lot, I said, if I'm going to preach the authentic word of God to you, I'm going to have to tell you there are certain things you want to do that you cannot do, and certain things that you are going to not want to do that you must do. And it's hard for that sometimes, especially for somebody who maybe doesn't have a very deep prayer life, maybe somebody who's not that familiar with, with scripture or the tradition of the church. It's hard for that sometimes to compete with the other kind of, quote, preacher on the other side saying, hey, come over here. I'll tell you that you're fine and everything you want to do is fine and everything you don't want to do, you don't have to do any of that. You know, it's very tempting it, 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 it is it is very very tempting to kind of to kind of kind of let ourselves kind of le allow ourselves to believe a falsehood just because it's a little bit maybe more fun maybe more pleasant more enjoyable at least temporarily right I, what i like about clement's epistle he gets into a point where he talks about the peace and the harmony of the universe and he uses that in his, as an example of how the church is supposed to be. How, how on earth does that fit together? Well, I think it fits together by, like this, because I think in those days, like nowadays, like we, um, yeah, the whole world is at our fingertips digitally. I mean, you, you, you yourselves are listening to this podcast. You chose to, or I don't know, maybe you were forced to, but you have access to this. <laughs> Probably on a phone. On a phone, yes. <laughs> and something that's yours. We live in, a, in, in the Western culture, right? Very, very wealthy usually wealthy culture as opposed to individuals who may be poor right but in those days people were oftentimes much poorer there was a lot less and when you have a lot less you tend to see yourself um in, in relationship to the universe around you you understand yourself as being 
a very small cog in the wheel as opposed to, let's say, the center of the universe. Right. So like had, you say, with, with technology, you know, it's very easy to place ourselves. Like, right. not only am I the center of the universe, but practically speaking, I am the measure of all things. And now, right. because this is possible, all things must bend to suit me. And I think right. that's what you mean by, we don't mean like geographically center of the universe, but we mean, you know, like, you know, everything must give me pleasure. Everything must right. like conform itself to me. And if it's not, there's something wrong with it. Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> in, profoundly wrong with right. it. Right. And these ancients, what they're doing is they're kind of looking at the universe. They're looking at how everything is around them. And they, they oftentimes could see the grand uh, scheme of things, the, the greater picture. And, then the, and this is what Clement's doing. He's basically saying, step back and actually take a look at what's going on, uh, what's happening. And I think he's, what he's saying is, be wise about this. Understand the division that's going on is tearing apart how the universe is supposed to be. And the church is, you know, it's just an icon, the cosmos, right? And and all this division is happening. And you have to understand what you have to do. And, and then he goes on again, and he talks about, let's look at all those holy people, Christ, all the martyrs, the holy men and women of the Old Testament, and ultimately God, you know, ultimately obeying God. And let's look at how they modeled obedience to God, how they followed God's way and God's law first and foremost. And, and then he says, that actually has a way of humbling you. Now, if I've been thinking about the present day, right, and we're seeing all kinds of scandals happening, right, in the church. And what do so many of us kind of think? It, we immediately say, well, then I'm just, I'm just going to leave. This is scandalous. I can't take it anymore. This is painful. But we are part of that universe. So I think what Clement is teaching us today is you can't leave what you are already a part of. There's nowhere to leave to, in a, in right. a certain <laughs> sense. In a certain, like, like, I want to leave the universe how you can't. You know, you can kind of, you know, you are a member of the church. You can distance yourself from it. You can try to, like, ignore it. You can try to, you can try to create a little miniature universe around yourself, right? But right. It, you just can't. It ultimately won't work. You know, and and we look at it and and we can see, yeah, we, we can see the yeah, the the every division kind of in the church historically has always been this trying to kind of recreate not just the church, not just create a false Christ, but like you said, like like well you like you said, like Clement said, to recreate kind of the universe around ourselves and our desires. In a certain sense, it becomes a denial of reality, some, some one element of reality or another, one element of either the natural reality or supernatural reality. And it, it simply doesn't work because we simply can't live in denial of reality because right. reality is real, you know, and, and we can't step outside of reality. We can pretend like we are. We can delude ourselves. And again, that pride, that cry, the pride that can cause division, because we can always find some people that are willing to go with us, you know, who would like mm -hmm. this reality or like it to really be this way, or this suits them a little bit better and their personality a little bit better. But ultimately, it's it's kind of a, a fool's errand in a sense. Right. And this is not saying that we just tolerate injustice. No. This is just saying that we are a part of the solution. Yes. And, and you know, I don't know, in, in recent times, I know that when, when I hear bad news about, you know, this particular incident or that particular scandal in the church, as a priest, it affects me deeply. Well, no, I would say but those you scandals know. are also a sort of denial of reality in, in the sense oh, yes. that, like, yeah. the people committing them, again, yes. are trying to shape that, you know, reality around themselves because they'll always justify it. They'll always, you know, say, well, I did it because of this or God really wants this or God, you know, it, that that's part of it. Yes. You know, but again, we don't we don't escape from it by by kind of running away from. No, we you know, like you said, we don't tolerate injustice. We use that reality, we use that set, that that truth of Christ to drive out and destroy the injustice. Yeah, and, and, and I think what I've done, and what's been very helpful to me, and I know this might seem foolish, but or, or just trite or simple, is I focus on the resurrection. I will say something to myself like, Christ is risen. In other words, the problem's solved. And what I like, there's a section here in Clement's epistle where he talks about... Um, because, you know, in those days, they weren't sure 
Christ is he is he coming back? You know, because Paul, you know, when you read when you read the New Testament, the early writings of Paul, you can see he's expecting Christ to come back soon. And then as it as it goes along later, we can kind of see, ah, oh, maybe he's not. So then he's preparing people to live in the world and to die well. Well, Clement here says, no, you have to keep focusing on the resurrection. And then he uses this really interesting image. He says, actually think about uh, the phoenix, the phoenix who which rises from the ashes. Okay, and and then he says, this is going to happen not just to us, but by extension to the church in which he lives. And because we have that belief, he says this. He says. Having then this hope, let our souls be bound to him who is faithful in his promises and just in his judgments. Okay, so he's saying Christ is risen and this is all going to end. It's only a matter of time. He says God actually sees all of these things. He's outside of time. He sees what's going to happen. He knows that we are suffering what we are suffering. But then he reminds us of all we can do. I remember someone once saying to me, I can just I, I go to my corner of the world and I control what my sphere of influence is and, and I leave everyone else be. And, I, you know, that's frustratingly simple, but it's actually very true. And then Clement says this. He says, let's just do this. Let's draw to him with holiness of spirit, lifting up our pure and undefiled hands unto him, loving our gracious and merciful father, who has made us partakers in the blessing of his elect. I mean, it, it's all about being holy ourselves, and yeah. that's how it's going to resolve. Well, because, I mean, in, when we talk about withdrawing to our own corner and pursuing holiness within ourselves, we don't mean, and, and, you, and you mentioned this earlier, we don't mean ignoring kind of the evil. We don't mean kind of this this kind of like, well, these, these, these people are doing bad things in the church, and maybe if I ignore it, it'll go away. But what we're saying is we have to cultivate that holiness within ourselves if we're going to do anything about it. If we're going to, you know, we have to be holy, we have to be humble, we have to be repentant. We have to be, as kind of an individual, if we're going to call the church back to that. And if the church is going to heal itself of kind of bad actors within the church or with division within the church or even division outside of the church. Otherwise, if we're not cultivating holiness within ourselves, we just become a bunch of kind of, we just become kind of an organization who's trying to maintain its unity. But what is the organization for? What's it about? Unity and what? You know, it's one of the things we were, we talk a lot about unity today. We talk a lot about it in politics. We talk a lot about it, you know, in the church and religion and things. And we like to kind of, one of the barbs that we can throw around for somebody is like, you know, he's very divisive, right? He's very divisive mm -hmm. or, you know, but I think we've lost, in a very real sense, what unity is, right? What What is unity? Unity, the unity that we should be striving for anyway, isn't just everybody kind of agreeing with each other, nor is it everybody kind of tolerating each other. It's everybody united to Christ and thus united to each other. Because if I'm, I, I think about it like kind of almost like spokes in a wheel, you know, if I'm united to Christ as the center and you're united to Christ, then by virtue of that, I'm also united to you. I think about that in terms of kind of, especially in terms of, you know, when we receive the Eucharist, we call it communion, right? Which yes. means a sort of unity. If I'm united, receiving our Lord in a state of grace, conforming my heart to his, and if you are as well, whether you're in the same parish as me, whether you're in the same diocese or eparchy as me, or whether you're, you know, a on the other side of the world is me. We are united in Christ. And I think that's one of the things that ultimately Clement is getting to there, is he's saying the reason why we need to be humble, the reason why we need to be repentant, the reason why we need to think on the risen Christ if we're to maintain unity is because that is our unity. That is yeah. where our unity comes from. We might be united in other ways, but all, ultimately those are meaningless. And I don't want to be united with a bunch of people in error or in sin or in evil. You know, what good does that do me? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what Clement does towards the end of his epistle. He basically says, let's quickly just put an end to this discord and let's fall down before the Lord and beseech him with tears that he would reconcile and restore us 
to 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 our former seemly and holy practice of brotherly love. And then towards the end of his epistle, he talks about what that might look like. He he actually says that sometimes, you know, we do have to admonish and correct one another. We have to be humble. Um, and it, it, of course, it hurts, right? It doesn't. It's not usually pleasant no. to receive that kind of admonition. But he's what. It's what also it, very often. Exist? It's also very yeah, often no. not pleasant to give it. You know, <laughs> oh, to yeah. correct someone. Yeah. You know, you know, a, a, you know, a pastor of a parish. We have to do that. And like, honestly, I would rather be corrected a thousand times than have to correct somebody once. Like, this is really unpleasant. You know. But again, it's all towards that unity in Christ. It's all geared towards that unity in Christ. It kind of reminds me of um, in Paul. You know, do not say I belong to Paul or I belong to Apollos. We all belong to Christ, right? You know, yes. like like why are we why are there divisions forming among all these people? Like I follow this person, I follow this person, and he's like, and when you read that epistle, you almost get that he's he's bewildered by it, yeah. right? Because like, what are you doing? We're united in Jesus. Like, who cares about Paul? Who cares about Apollos? Who cares about Cephas? Who cares about any of these? Like, like it's Christ. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, you he, know? <laughs> I mean, he describes how the church is supposed to look here in his epistle, and he, he Clement, uses no. the Clement. He yeah. uses the image of the body. He says. Let the body be preserved in Christ. Let everyone be subject to his neighbor according to the special gift bestowed upon him. Let the strong not despise the weak. Let the weak show respect to the strong. Let the rich provide for the poor and let the poor bless God because he has given him one by whom his need may be supplied. Thank you, God, that I am poor, that I can have a rich man to actually give me what I need. Let the wise display his wisdom not just by words, but by deeds. Let the humble not bear testimony to himself, but leave witness to be born to him by another. Let whoever is pure not grow proud of it and boast, knowing that it was another who bestowed on him the gift of continence. Let's consider then of what we are made, um, who and what kinds of beings we came into the world. And then he says this, as if out of a sepulcher and from utter darkness, um, he who made us fashioned us. He prepared us to receive his bountiful gifts even before we were born. And so we ought to render thanks to him uh, forever and ever. I mean, what? I mean, if every one of us Christians lived in this way, we would all be saints and so many problems would be solved. Absolutely. But like, like we keep saying, it's pride that gets in the way. It's I want this thing. I don't. I how dare you correct me? How you know? Like you know? You know? It's 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 the again. It's the creating the universe of our own mind where we are the center and everything conforms to us. But you know the the way he speaks is so it's so beautiful and beautifully said, but also accurately said. You know? You know? And right. and, and and getting to the point you know, very, very quickly and very neatly and admonishing while also kind of lifting up, you know, and, and, and giving this beautiful vision that, again, one of the problems, because we, we kind of started off by talking about how we tend to look at this division of the church is inevitable. And we kind of look at it and we say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if every Christian lived that way? I roll. We know it's not going to happen, but it could. Yeah. Like, and the thing is, and let's say, let's say there are about, how many Christians are there in the world? Uh, Maybe about yeah. 2 billion, you know, yeah. does that seem about right? I don't know. But let's say 2 billion just for the sake of it. Okay, maybe there's nothing I can do about 1,999,999,999 of those Christians. You know what? And maybe I can't make them all live that way. But you know what you can do? You can make... I can make myself live that way. You can make yourself live that way by the grace of God, of course, only, you know, and so part of the problem is, and part of the pride in unity is we tend to sit there and we hear something like that. And we tend to think, oh, well, not everybody's going to do that, especially this person at my church, this person at my work, this person, you know, you know, even, even for us, this other priest I know, he's not going to do that, you know, like, you know, and we tend to look at all the people who need to do that. And then we kind of walk away kind of satisfied where, you know, like, well, they're not going to do it. And I know they should be doing it. But you know what? As he says, let the wise show their wisdom, not by their words, but by their deeds. If we're truly wise, we'll say we won't really even think about those other people. But we'll say, why don't I do that? 
That's right. Why don't I do that? You know, because the thing is, if everybody is pointing at everybody else not doing it, then nothing is going to happen. And maybe you can only do just that one. But if that's all you can do, at least do that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, you're just <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing. It's certainly it, it would be very easy for me. Not that I'm doing it, of course, because but it would be very easy for me to sit here and listen to what Clement says and to think about all of the ways that you don't do that. It would be very easy for you to look across this table and say the same thing to me. And that's why we do it, because it's easy. It's hard to say, oh, I don't do any of those things. Mm-hmm. And then, but I'm going to start or I'm going to try. I'm going to start praying for that grace to be able to do it. I'm going to humble myself to be able to do it. That's hard. So we don't do it. But, you know, if we if we did, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if we did, I mean, the world's not going to become perfect tomorrow. I don't expect that if I become more humble this evening, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and find out like that the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Orthodox and the Catholics and the and the Lutherans are all united into one, you know, like this, I, I don't expect that to happen tomorrow. But I can do my, you know, one half of one billionth of a percent. <laughs> yes. You know, if that's all I can do, at least I ought to do that. You and that's know. and that's how we achieve sanctity, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. We continue to pray for the unity in Christ and for our own repentance and for our own humility, for our own sanctity, as we um, seek to do our part and always to follow God in all things. God bless you and see you again soon.